Welcome back. Uh, it's been a few weeks, and today we're going to discuss the road to partition, but we're not going to discuss partition itself. We're going to discuss the events during the period of the British Raj, which lasted from 1858 to 1947. We're going to stop in 1946, by the way. Uh, that led to the partition of India in 1947, which was arguably the most horrific event in the history of the Indian subcontinent when you take out uh, of the equation famines and things like that. Uh, partition uh, itself uh, deserves a whole episode, maybe two episodes, and it's going to guide everything we do uh, in, that, in this series after. So this is the road to partition, which begins right after the rebellion we talked about in the last episode, the Sepoy Mutiny, the Indian War of Independence, however you want to characterize the events from 1857 to 1859. Now, in the early 1900s, you had Lord Curzon as the Viceroy of India under the new government setup, which we're actually going to get into in the next episode. Uh, but he's the Viceroy. He's effectively uh, running India at this point. He makes a decision. He was a great reformer. He did some very good things as the British Viceroy in India. But one thing he did that remains to this day controversial and foretold the story of partition was the partition of Bengal. And as you can see on this map, the green areas are Muslim areas, the pink areas are Hindu areas, yellow areas are Buddhist areas. Bengal is divided uh, very uh, neatly between Hindu majority and Muslim majority areas. Lord Curzon thinks he'll divide the province and have effectively a Muslim part of Bengal, uh, East Bengal, and a Hindu part of Bengal, West Bengal. That did not go over very well. This is 1905 when they divide Bengal. They reversed the division in 1911. Here is uh, some of the other religions. Uh, we talked about Buddhists already. Sikhs concentrated in, uh, in Punjab. And, uh, and Jains who were around uh, uh, in, in Western India, Gujarat, what is now modern day Gujarat, and uh, Maharashtra, uh, what was then the Bombay presidency in the British Raj, uh, which was the governing uh, uh, instrument we'll talk about more next week. Now this is Mahatma Gandhi heroically returning to India uh, as a leader of the Indian National Congress, the big pro-independence party. Uh, returning to India after about 20 years in South Africa as a barista, as a, as a lawyer. And Gandhi's return to India would have major impacts. We're going to talk more about that next week, but it, we're going to talk about it in the context of Hindu-Muslim relations today. Muhammad Jinnah, the father of Pakistan, uh, was the leader of the Muslim League. He was a member of Congress. He was a congressman who shared uh, Gandhi and Nehru's goals of an independent India, was not necessarily on board with a fully independent Pakistan uh, initially, but eventually gets there. He is more secular than he's given credit for today. Uh, he's seen as a great hero uh, by some Muslim fanatics today, religious uh, zealots. He was not one, by the way. He was not a religious fanatic. So the concept of Pakistan actually comes from Saeed Ahmed Khan, uh, the man pictured, who came up with the idea of Pakistan as a Muslim homeland. Uh, it's an algorithm. Pa Pakistan uh, yeah, stands for you know, Punjab, Afghanistan is the A, uh, K is Kashmir, uh, I, S must be the Sindh. I, I'm not sure what every, every initial means, but an idea of a Muslim homeland, uh, and this is the initial Muslim League when they broke off of the Indian National Congress and formed in the 1920s, the feeling was that an independent India would be Hindu dominated. The Hindus were in the majority and that Muslims would be discriminated against. And in fact, uh, in reality, in British India, the economic situation was that higher caste Hindus did better than, than Muslims and actually did better than lower caste Hindus as well and did better than Buddhists and did better uh, than others. But uh, there was a legitimate concern and, I, and I, we're going to get more into this when we talk about partition specifically. But the Muslim League becomes a potent political force, particularly in uh, Punjab, the Sindh, which is at this point part of the British presidency, uh, the Bombay presidency, and eventually in East Bengal. It's not initially in East Bengal, and, and 
I think many of you know what happens uh, with Bengal and Punjab being in the same country after partition and, and uh, uh, the people in East Bengal suddenly felt more Pakistani, uh, less, uh, less Muslim and more Bengali. Um, now, the Muslim League and Congress still uh, work together on some of the uh, resistance against British rule. This is an example of, of the Congress uh, under Gandhi and Nehru in the 1930s protesting and you see the Muslim League flags with the crescent there. Uh, this is a joint effort. The 1945 parliamentary elections uh, for, the, for the Indian uh, parliament, when still, this is the last election under British rule, this is when the Muslim League had really made their inroads. You see they win in, in uh, East Bengal, they win most of the seats in Punjab, a few seats uh, uh, won by Congress. They win all the seats in the Sindh. Uh, the Congress is strong in Hindustan, South India, and the Bombay presidency. So at this point, you're dealing with a situation where um, partition is inevitable. Muslim areas are voting for a Muslim party. Hindu areas are voting for a secular party, but a party dominated by Hindus. And we'll pick this up next time.